Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here with you. I'm very grateful to Pastor God So, not Godfrey, right? <laughs> Godfrey God So, for his kind invitation to worship with you. Now, worshiping together is maybe the greatest thing we can do to worship God. Um, the, we're happy for the glimpsineers and for their ministry today um, in our worship. And they did not send me the memo about the blue shirt. Maybe they felt that they had sufficient people to sing. But we're really, really happy for their, their, their ministry. Please turn with me to Mark 2, our scripture. If you close it, please open it so that um, we may follow the narrative as we go through. Jesus had completed his first missionary journey during which he had performed numerous miracles. And everywhere he went, you know, people would flock to him. And there was hardly anywhere he could find rest until somehow he managed to um, return to Capernaum without anyone knowing. He remained incognito just for a few days, but it wasn't long before news of his presence leaked out, even without the benefit of Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. The news spread like wildfire. Adventists have always had their own social media. You know that, don't you? Well, it happens somewhere in the Adventist world, and immediately somebody else knows about it somewhere else. Now, the people of Capernaum had heard how Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law, and how he had cast out demons. Now they wanted to see him for themselves. Most probably, many went because they wanted to see him heal or because they wanted healing for themselves. No doubt, they brought their sick with them. You know, there's always an excitement, thrills and attraction when we hear about healing. If it were announced at the conclusion of the service by Sister Phipps that I'd be here next week to preach the gospel, it wouldn't really cause much stir among you. Hopefully most of you would return. One or two of you might even invite a friend. But if today I were to perform some act of healing, such as to cause uh, someone to walk again, or restore hearing to the deaf or speech to the dumb, you could be sure that I'm up on here and I would be here next week. There would not be room in this church. Not only would you be here, but you'd have told your families, your friends, your neighbors, and they would not need much persuasion because your passion and their curiosity couldn't keep them away. That's human nature. We are excited by the extraordinary. Unfortunately, we do not always recognize that the gospel is the most extraordinary of all things. So the people filled the house where Jesus was staying until they spilled out onto the courtyard. They pushed forward so tightly it was almost impossible to move, perhaps wanting to see Jesus perform a miracle. Anyone here ever been to London, England? Okay. It's traveling on the ground at rush hour time. I remember going to college or later on to work, rush hour from uh, Tooting Broadway. And sometimes the trains are so full, you could stand like this, you wouldn't fall over. Because the, the crush was so, so, so strong. So, so maybe they were like that. They wanted him to 
maybe do something. But instead, he preached the word of God to them. That is, he taught them about the kingdom of God. The text does not tell us how they responded to his preaching. Maybe they didn't realize that in his preaching, he was actually performing the greatest miracle of all. He was offering them forgiveness and healing from sin. But verse 3 informs us that after the crowd had arrived, some of the men came. Four of them. And carrying a paralyzed man on his bed between them. The focus has shifted now from the crowd to these four able-bodied men and one who was unable to help himself, a paralyzed man. Now, Scripture does not tell us much about the man, except that he was paralyzed. Whether or not his entire body was affected is not mentioned. Only that he had to be carried. He was totally dependent. Unable to do anything for himself, this man had to depend on others. I don't know if you can imagine what he had to go through in his life. I mean, just a simple action of turning around on his bed was beyond him. His mind alert, but his body hopeless. We cannot tell if he had become immune to the shame that accompanied him when others had to help him with his most private bodily functions. It would have been so easy for him to lay there and pity himself. Immobile, helpless, feeling totally useless. Not being able to take care of himself, much less to work and contribute to his family. The social scientists tell us how important it is for a man to work and how it determines his self-worth. This man could not have felt any worth whatsoever. Even in the description of this man, the gospel writers, including Mark, here simply mentions him by his medical condition. Don't we often do the same? We describe people by their disability, their body size, or ethnicity, and not take care, take time to find out about a per to find a person's name, their identity. You see, without a name, a person has no value or estimation. We seek out the names of those in whom we are interested. That's why when a young man meets a young woman who catches his eye, he immediately wants to know what? Well, I, I used to. Her name. However, whenever we come across those who are destitute, homeless, sitting in the streets with outstretched palms, longing for us to put a few coins in them, we don't really see them as individuals with identity. Usually we see them as nuisances or annoyances getting in our way. So we quickly hurry by, wanting to put them out of our vision and out of our conscience. Then they don't exist. Not so with God. In John 10, he is the good shepherd. And he says, I call you by your name. You're my sheep. He knows my name. He knows your name because he loves us with an extraordinary love. Nothing is said of this nameless paralytic, other than his disability. No personality, no family, no worth. But in Capernaum, there were others like him. 
who were at the very bottom of society with no ability to help themselves or the very best they were able to do was never enough to move them from where they were. They needed someone else to help them. Today, right in our city here, there are others who are at the bottom or even near to the bottom of our society who are in the same situation. Their circumstance so hopeless that even when they do their very best to help themselves, like the paralytic, it is of no consequence. Even when they make some progress, they're so far down the socioeconomic ladder that nothing changes for them. They too need someone to help them. The text says four men carried a paralytic on the mat that was used for his bed. Now we need to really to admire these men because they are the nameless heroes of this passage. The Bible writer does not mention their names either. It only describes their action. It's their work for the paralytic that is highlighted, not their identities. You see, some of us, and I've seen it in church, I've been pastoring for a number of years now. Some of us want name recognition, but not the work. Others will do the work, but are never satisfied until they are recognized or rewarded for their work. Brothers and sisters, I am convinced that the true value of a person is measured by what he gives and not what he hopes to receive. Our works of service do not have to be published. I remember a young man here and an old preacher Preach says that all of us cannot work in God's front garden. In God's front garden where everyone sees the result of our hand, handiwork. He says some of us have to work in God's backyard where no one will ever see what we do. He says it doesn't matter whether front garden or backyard, just give God praise. You're working in his property. By the time these anonymous men arrived at the home where Jesus was teaching, they were so late they could not even get near to the clogged doorway. Could it be that the reason they were late was because they had to go and get the paralyzed man? See, by going for him and then determining the best way to transport him delayed them. You see, it had cost them to help the paralyzed man, and now they themselves could not get near to Jesus. We do not know if the paralytic had asked to be taken to Jesus, or what these men had in their compassion for him had initiated the task. We don't know. The Bible says nothing about their relationship to him. But what we understand is that they simply cared enough for him to take him to Jesus. What happened after that would be between a man and Jesus. Their part was to do what? Take him to Jesus. As God's children, we must care for people to the extent that we will suffer inconvenience and make sacrifices in order to take people to Jesus. To help them. The paralyzed of our society the downtrodden, the destitute, the distressed, the brokenhearted, the spiritually needy, those who cannot help themselves, those who need us to turn them over and to lift them up. We must be the anonymous men and women who will sacrifice in order to help them and to take them to Jesus. And believe me, it costs to help someone. You have to give up something in order to help someone. It may cost you time, money, effort, even comfort, but giving means just that, to give. You know, in Mark 5.30, after a woman who had been suffering for 12 years 
with a hemorrhage after she touched the hem of his garment. Scripture says that Jesus felt power go what? Out from him. That's why John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It costs to give. And when you give, your storehouse is depleted. At that moment, you have less. But as soon as you realize that the little that you have given is abundance to the person whom you have reached out and helped, it is as if your storehouse has been refilled to overflowing. This is what happens when we're faithful in tithing, where we are encouraged to move away from selfishness. In Malachi 3.10, God promises that when we are faithful in tithing, in order that there is an abundant supply, he says, see if I will not throw open the front gates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you will not have enough room to receive it. It's the same when you help someone. If we want to reach out to our community, as I'm sure Willowdale does, we must be willing to give of ourselves, our time, and of our means. We must play our part. What is our part? The man took, him to, took the paralytic to Jesus. But when they got to where Jesus was, it looked like their mission was about to fail. Because the crowd was so dense. But these men were, were determined. But Andre, Andre? Yeah, that's right. You see, nothing would prevent them from taking a paralytic to Jesus. So they look for another route. The lesson simple. Whenever we are faced with a seemingly impossible situation, seek another way to take someone to Jesus. When the traditional methods will not work, do something unorthodox. There is always a way because Jesus is inside the house. We want to be where Jesus is. You must not give up. The poor paralytic had no hope but Jesus. His life had no value without Jesus. So they looked for another route and they made their way up to the flat roof of the house. You know the story well. And they dug a hole large enough to lower the man through. You can just imagine that crowd tightly packed around Jesus. All of a sudden, bits of plaster and dirt begins falling down. And the, 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 the natural reaction is to do what? Step back, right? Oh, some sore toes that day. And Jesus sees teaching and he looked up. Everyone looked up. And as Jesus looked, he saw four men's faces silhouetted against the sky. And they began to lower the man down right to the feet of Jesus. The four men had done their part. They had taken the paralytic to Jesus. Can you imagine their joy? They found a way. The man had not been healed. I mean, he was still there on his mat, cannot move. The most he could do is breathe and blink. But they were jubilant because that brought him to Jesus. They did not attempt to heal him. I mean, they couldn't. They did what they were able to do to take the man to Jesus. In our outreach to our community, do not expect to do the impossible. It will only lead to disappointment and frustration. Our role is to do what we are able to do. But there's a lot more that we can do. But we must be tireless about doing it. And when there are obstacles, we must find a way around them. If it means going to the roof and digging a hole, then by all means, do that. Now, as people just begin to get over the shock of seeing the man lowered, Jesus surprised them by saying, in verse 5, Son, your sins are forgiven. Verse 5 says, when Jesus saw their faith, 
when he saw their faith. See, as Jesus saw the four men lowering a sick man, he realized the extent to which they had gone. And he was immediately moved by their faith. It was faith, however, not only of the four men, but also of the paralytic. I mean, he's been lowered down, you know. When Jesus saw their faith, he was deeply moved. And as I read the scriptures, I find that Jesus is always moved by faith. The centurion in Matthew 8 who said to Jesus, just speak the word and my servant will be healed. The woman with a hemorrhage of 12 years in Matthew 9, 22, who said, if I can just touch the hem of his garments, I will be healed. Nothing moved Jesus as much as faith did. And he sought it out. And wherever he found faith, he rewarded it. He still rewards faith today. See, faith is a declaration. It's a declaration that, that says, Jesus is my Lord. Faith states that Jesus is the answer to all my needs and all my, my longings. Faith says that Jesus is my foundation. On him will I stand. So while the four men and the sick man might not have fully embraced him as Messiah. They had faith that he was able to heal. So they brought the man to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? He calls him son. The first thing he does is to take this nameless, worthless, pitiful man often invisible to society, and calls him son. A term of endearment. Jesus looked at the sinner, besieged, brutalized by sin, left helpless, and he looked at him as his own child. It's the same way Jesus looks at you and me. His heart as a creator must have gone out to his creation to see him there under the burden of sin. And so he pronounces the word, Son, your sins are forgiven. The man was paralyzed, but Jesus declared him what? Forgiven. The man came seeking healing, not forgiveness, but Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. See, we often don't know what we need, but Jesus does. Jesus looked at the man and he knew that his sickness was linked to his mind and his guilt of sin. There was no point healing the body, you know, that would eventually decay at death unless you first heal the man of sin. Now please, please, do not leave here today with the impression that whenever a person is sick, it's because of guilt brought on by sin. Okay, don't do that. Sometimes God permits his children to suffer sorrow so they might cling all the more to his outstretched hands. Have you noticed when you pray most, is when you are in trouble. During the stilling of the storm, when the disciples were in the boat being tossed to and fro, the disciples learned more in that boat than they ever would have if they'd stayed on the beach. Daniel, we heard about him in the story this morning, would never have known God's power to shut the mouths of the lions had he not been sent into the lion's den. You see, history attests, sorry, the simple fact that some of God's most faithful saints have suffered the most, yet their suffering brought them nearer to Christ. The paralytic was different. He had sinned. He knew it. And so did Jesus. When Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, the man didn't argue or protest. 
He knew it. He knew it. But he accepted the forgiveness and was ready to use his limbs again. So as soon as Jesus commanded, take up your mat and go home. The man who had not been able to help himself, always dependent on someone else for his simplest movement, immediately stood up. His faith harmonized with obedience. He took up his bed and he walked out as the tightly packed crowd somehow parted to let him through. Verse 12 says that all were amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. The crowd had come curious to see Jesus. Instead, they left glorifying God. And all because of four men and some others who gave of themselves their time their means to reach out to someone who was in a worse position than their own. There was someone who needed to help him take him to Jesus. They were the someones. Which of these nameless men would have thought that God would be glorified because of their selfless concern for a fellow human being? Yet, that's exactly what happens, brothers and sisters, when we reach out to help people in our community. In Matthew 25, Jesus said that when we perform acts of mercy and charity to the least of those in our community, we are doing it unto to him, and he will reward us accordingly. The four men brought the sick man to Jesus for healing. But God gave him grace. He forgave him even though the man did not come confessing or repenting of his sins. Jesus still gave him grace. The four men, now forgotten by everyone in the house, had not realized that in their desire to help the needy man, they had become instruments of God's grace. You and I may be instruments of God's grace. He calls us the salt of the earth, a light set upon a hill. God's grace, brothers and sisters, may be given to men, women, boys, and girls simply because we take the time to stretch out our hands and offer care to them. And God's name will be glorified because of our outreach to our community. So let us become instruments of God's grace. Are you willing today to be a means by which someone is helped? Are you courageous enough to take someone to Jesus? Look what happens when you do. They receive God's grace. They are forgiven. They are healed. And God's name is glorified just because of you. I call you today to commit yourself to God and ask him to fill you with compassion for others and to give you courage to move from your place of comfort so that you will never Ever be satisfied or content unless you are helping someone else. I urge you, think of the grace God has given you. You have now assurance. You have his peace. You have confidence. You possess a quality of life that millions are seeking but are looking for in the wrong places. And you are the instruments by which they may have what you have. Today I appeal to you as we sing our hymn. And as we close the prayer. That you will make a commitment. To be an instrument of God's grace. Amen. Let us sing asking God to have his own way in our life today.